We grew up here, in this ancient volcano crater filled with rainforests. The heavy rains and volcanic soil means that tropical fruit grow everywhere. Our uncle has some coffee berries growing, so we're attempting the long process of making coffee from scratch. This is something that we've always wanted to learn, and honestly, the feeling of being self-sufficient in terms of something that we use every day is just so exciting. Hand-picking coffee is actually necessary to avoid under- or overripe berries. It can be mechanised, but then the coffee tastes a lot worse because it has all of the different berries. Coffee processing is known for its exploitation of workers and huge environmental impacts, so we really want to learn how to live more traditionally, relying on no one but ourselves and our community. It feels really meaningful to be so connected to our food. This process is long, hard, time consuming and probably not worth it, but it teaches us so much. It has made us realise that we want to at least understand the process behind everything that we consume. It's so strange, really, that we can go through life eating and drinking all of these things that we don't even know how they are made or where they come from. Reconnecting to traditional ways of creating and consuming is so important as a society. In coffee processing, the berries are normally not used and they often pollute rivers and waterways after they are thrown out. You can make a tea from them or just snack on them, but we're giving our leftovers to the chickens to eat. After a long time fermenting, it's finally time to dry the beans. Although, after a day, I realised that this climate is too humid for sun drying, so I use a dehydrator instead. The next day, they were finally ready for dehusking. This was definitely the hardest part of the process. I stayed up late and woke up early for days trying to get the shells off every bean. I love a simple task like this though, and the hours of hard work just connected me more to my coffee. Coffee roasting is quite an art. The smells are incredible and fill the whole room, and slowly the beans become darker and darker. I think I didn't roast it hard enough this time though. I thought it would be romantic to hand grind, but I quickly realised that it was way too much work and I switched to the machine grinder. Watching coffee grinds come out was an incredible moment. I had seen them grown, harvested, separated, fermented, dried, dehusked, roasted, and now turn into this magic. Coffee made from the trees also deserves pastries created from fruit, and mulberry season is my favourite for making elaborate breakfasts from the farm. This gluten-free dough is my go-to for anything and everything.
In the 1800s, 90% of the population lived on farms, and it was only the elite who weren't connected to agriculture. Now it's the opposite. Food has become so commercialized that only elite corporations farm our food. And as individuals, we are shielded from this connection to what we eat. In the hands of huge companies, our food is no longer grown for taste, health, climate or joy, it's just grown for profit. To resist the over-commercialized food systems, we try to grow as much as possible. To buy from local and organic growers, and just to appreciate every taste. I think that this appreciation leads to a curiosity, and curiosity leads to understanding and connection of our food systems. <laughs> Coffee is a subtropical plant, so it grows well around here, although it can grow so well that it can become a weed. This is why we're wary of planting it, because we don't think we can take on the responsibility of covering it so that the birds don't spread the seeds. We explore the meaning of traditional crafts, growing our own food, and being self-sufficient in our book, and you can pre-order it now. Custard apples fill the trees right now, and we eat them every day. They taste like a custody cream, but we love them most in savoury food. having a day off and doing kind of nothing. I'm just sewing something for myself and it feels good to just sew something. Not sure how it's going to turn out but it's just all about the fun. Our favourite way to spend our time is to create and craft. The joy you gain from slow days making things with your hands is incredible. We love traditional crafts like sewing, painting and embroidering. Engaging with our creative sides through these ancient crafts. Creating with zero waste is something that's really important to us. As we paint, sew, or make anything, we consider the waste that it will create. This is why we love the idea of creating from secondhand materials and honoring something that would otherwise have been rubbish. Julia is painting a secondhand vase and giving it new life while I am sewing an old carton. These practices of creativity also let us connect with what we consume. What a yummy 
know if it's between these two. That one's too dark and that one's too light. have really stuffed up here I've let the thread go and because it's a chain stitch if it starts to unravel the whole thing can unravel so I need to catch the thread before it all unravels I'm scared where is it oh. Almost finished, but now I need to make a facing for the top because I'm not doing a waistband, and then also I need to hem it. And then I'm done! So I made this skirt out of an old curtain, which you can see is almost all finished, but I've got a bit of scrap left here, which I'll use for the facing. Not to be dramatic, but me and Clover almost just died. There was a massive brown snake. I thought Clover was barking. Stop it, get out of the way, you're scared. Um, Clover was barking a lot and there's been this massive python hanging out here and pythons are fine and they're not dangerous at all. And so I just went out to check on it to make sure, you know, Clover wasn't being naughty or anything. He's kind of, this is his second snake season and he was just a puppy last time. So he still doesn't really know what to do around snakes but he's been really good so far. But he was barking and telling me that there was a snake. So I went to check in and I thought it was gonna be, be a chill python, but it was a massive, massive brown snake. And brown snakes are, yeah, the worst. They are the scariest snakes in the world. They're, I think they're the second most venomous snake in the world. They hold so much venom and you just don't wanna go anywhere near them. Brown snakes are just, they're also aggressive. Like pythons aren't at all. Pythons will just go past, but browns will attack and they're really fast and you can't even see it and they just bite and then yeah it's not good and Clover was barking right at one and he was circling it and I ran 
I was stupid, I shouldn't have, but I ran because I thought that it was just a python. So then I was really close to the brown snake, and then the brown snake put its little head up, which is not good, because that means it's kind of ready to attack, and it was looking at me. Well, I don't think it was looking, because I don't think snakes can see, but they can feel vibrations, so I just stayed really still, but I was like standing on top of a log, so it was quite aggressive, like the way I was standing was probably not good for the snake. And it just looked at me and I looked at it and then Clover just didn't know what to do and he was just running around in the background. Which isn't good because I was trying to be still, wasn't I Clover? But you weren't. So the brown snake could kind of see that we were there and luckily it kind of just like stayed there for a bit and then when Clover started moving a lot it just slid away and got scared. Like, they're always more scared of us than we are of them so it's okay but oh that was really scary. I need to be more careful, there are so many brown snakes around at the moment and I mean, there's so many snakes around, so I keep thinking they're just going to be pythons, and then it's a brown snake, and oh, I feel, I feel so like, I've turned into liquid around snakes. I just feel so gross. <laughs> the creepiest thing I think about brown snakes is the way you can tell them apart from like a whip snake is their eyes, because they have mean eyes. I swear, I don't think this is just me, but you look into, <laughs> you were scared, you were scared. You look into their eyes, and you can see meanness, whereas other snakes have friendly eyes. You look into their eyes and they look cute. They look, they look like they're just chilling and they're just going about their day. But brown snakes, you stare at them and you can tell. You can tell that they're mean. You can tell that they'll, they'll attack. Anyway, me and Clover are just gonna hide inside for a while and not go anywhere near that brown snake. I'm not going outside. I'm not going outside ever again, Clover. So I've been trying to get this tiny sewing machine working still. But there's still quite a few problems and the biggest one is just the rust everywhere. But last week everyone was so nice and had so many suggestions and I think that I'm going to put it in vinegar and water because a lot of people suggested that and that sounds great. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, you can pre-order our book in the link in our description. The music in this video is by Fellow Hollow, and they have just released their newest album. You can find their links in our description too. Thanks so much to our patrons for your support on our journey.